West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Last week, the right-wing media spin machine went into overdrive because of this legal filing, this vague legal filing by special counsel John Durham. This legal filing pointed to internet traffic that may have been linked uh, in some ways to the Clinton campaign, and it became this alleged scandal all across Fox and Breitbart and the right-wing web, all these shouts that Trump, Donald Trump, was spied on by the Clinton campaign. Those shouts were not based in reality, and by the end of the week, they really fell apart under fact-checking and even under Durham's own cleanup effort. But during that week on Fox, this was covered, I don't want to just say extensively, it was covered ferociously. We added up the mentions of Durham throughout the week. We came up with more than 600 mentions of Durham and of this so-called scandal. All of it really focusing, targeting on Hillary Clinton, that candidate, that former candidate, that Fox just can't quit. So, with that in mind, I got an email overnight that I want to share with you. This is from, uh, this is an email exchange between a Fox producer, actually a Fox editor, and Philippe Reigns, a longtime Clinton confidant. So let me show you this because it gives you a sense of what Clinton world is thinking about Fox. And maybe you'll agree, and maybe you'll disagree. This email is a request for comment, a pretty standard request for comment from a Fox digital editor saying, hey, we'd like to request a short interview with you to talk about your reaction to the recent headlines regarding the alleged surveillance of Trump's team. So again, rooted on a lie, but they're asking for an interview. So it's good they asked for an interview. Here was the response from Philly Brains. He said, I don't do TV anymore. But he said what the right is doing right now with its insanely overwrought and hysterical reaction to the most recent Durham filing will be a case study and yet another plunge deeper into the abyss. Fox and others like it pretend that it's providing information nobody else is covering. The audience is made to feel they're in on a secret that only they are over-informed and the rest of us live in a bubble devoid of inconvenient truths. Philippe went on to say, you know that's BS. The distinction in coverage is in two interrelated ways, truthfulness and volume. Those covering it truthfully have looked at it factually and given it the appropriate time. Those treating their audience like fools to buy anything sold to them are being inundated with it. So what did the Fox editor say in response? He said, I'm going to request a write-up on this. We're going to get it up on the website. I'm also, I think he said, the channel will most likely pick up uh, and air portions of it, meaning Philippe's email. Uh, We're going to quote this on TV. We're going to air this on the website. That's what the Fox staffer said, but that was days ago, and none of those comments from Philippe Reigns have appeared on Fox. They haven't shown up on the website, as far as I can tell either. So it's another example of how the Fox machine works. They obsessed over Hillary Clinton all week, talking about this being bigger than Watergate, uh, trying to cover every supposed angle. Then when the Clinton camp actually has something to say, when one of Clinton's former senior aides has something really interesting to say, they ignored it. In fact, uh, Fox dropped off its Clinton covers by the end of the week. Right around the time she attacked Fox in a speech and said the network was coming close to actual malice 
a legal term that people usually use when they're thinking of suing someone. Adrienne Elrod is familiar with this Fox machine firsthand. She's the former director of strategic communication for Hillary for America. She's a Democratic strategist who was a regular on Fox back in 2017, but it's been some time since she's appeared on the network and she's here with me now. Adrienne, why did you decide to stop appearing on Fox? Well, you know, Brian, first of all, thank you so much for having me on today. And I'm glad that you read Philippe's um, email in full because it really does paint the picture of what the Clinton campaign and Hillary Clinton as a person has been dealing with for a long time when it comes to Fox News. Um, but look, you know, I thought, you know, Brian, after Trump won in 2016, uh, that perhaps, you know, some of us who were senior aides on Hillary Clinton's campaign going on Fox News and trying to, you know, have a dialogue, ongoing dialogue with the viewers would make some sort of difference. And I soon learned very quickly that it just simply wasn't going to happen. Um, you know, I looked at the topics that I often got about four to five minutes before I would go on air. Um, and, and no other network was covering some of these topics because they weren't newsworthy, because they were conspiracy theory driven, very much related to what were the topic that we're talking about today. Um, and it became that much harder to go on and even have a, you know, quasi serious conversation because again, the topics that I was given were oftentimes about Hillary Clinton, who of course at that time had retreated into private life. And, and secondly, they were in complete diversion from all of Trump's problems as president. So I decided soon um, after, you know, maybe going on for about eight, nine months in 2017, this just simply wasn't working. And the mm. network was not even trying to have their quote unquote fair and balanced coverage, which they still like to tout. So this is the tension that Democratic strategists feel. And in the case of Clinton, there's constant talk on Fox, I think fantastical, dreamy talk, that she's going to run for president again in 2024. Would, would you like to address that? What would you say to that? I think Hillary Clinton's made it very clear that she's not running for president in 2024. But look, Ryan, you cover this constantly, and I'm so glad that you do. If, if Hillary Clinton, if there's even one tiny inkling that she might run for public office again, Fox News is going to grasp onto that and they're going to cover it. Why? Because she drives ratings. Driving ratings means driving advertising dollars, which means more revenue for the network. So the very thought that she or even her husband, Bill Clinton, won't be running for office again drives them absolutely crazy because they mm. need to try to find some narrative, some line of, of, of you know, of, of, of news reporting that they can use to try to keep their name in the news so they can drive advertising dollars into their network. And they talk about Hillary the spy while they ignore uh, Trump's classified document scandal. Adrian, thank you very much for being exactly. here. Let me bring the uh, panel Thanks, back Brian. with me. Mara Scavacampo here, Joe Perrinan and David Zerowick. Joe, you were former president of Fox News. You left right as Roger Ailes came in and it became a cable network in the mid 1990s. But you've, you observed Fox up close. Um, do you recognize the place that you we were at in the 90s when you were trying to build a, a news division for Fox? We did not uh, have uh, a cable uh, news organization, as you pointed out. And when Roger came in as chairman, uh, he asked me to stay on, but he asked me if I would uh, 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 agree to go along with creating an alternative news channel. And that was a buzz for me. Uh, and a buzz, I just said I can't uh, get involved in alternatives, and I left. Um, I do want to point out one thing, though, that... Yeah. This is a business. Right. This is not about journalism for them. This is about, as pointed out a moment ago, this is about driving ratings and revenues. And the way to be able to get uh, ratings and revenues, and this is a problem throughout the cable news, quite frankly, and, and is that journalism is sort of subordinated to the idea of having to be number one, get the ratings, and being able to make money. Fox is making billions of dollars. They've got, what, three to five million people watching in prime time. That's less than, that's a 1% of the population. But they're able to monetize that. And every time you mention, mention Hillary, yeah. or I can name Biden as senile, all that stuff, you end up engaging your audience. They stay mm -hmm. with you. And that drives your ratings up. So this is a business. Another example of that, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Let's put on screen her recent tweet about Tucker Carlson. Carlson was smearing her for, for a long time on Friday night. She responded by saying, I want to know why is Tucker allowed and paid to engage in clear, targeted, libelous harassment that endangers people and drives so many violent threats that people have to fundraise for their own safety, that they have to fundraise to protect themselves. Dave Zerwick, your reaction to this, uh, people uh, on every side uh, in the public public space get threats. Tucker Carlson's family gets threats. But AOC's point is, these you know individuals that he goes after who don't have the resources Tucker has, they end up feeling endangered. And she's using the word libelous. What do you read into that, David? 
You listen, I, I really, you know, I, when watching both of these, and I think the, the attack on Hillary Clinton and the attack on AOC are connected, is connected. When Fox hosts go after a lot of people, they're creating what Joe talked about. They're creating a narrative, and here's the villain, villain, and they get very personal, and they want you to hate the villain. But when they do it with women, I, I thought, well, it gets kind of sexist. No, it's steeped in sexism and misogyny. And Tucker Carlson, I really think the, the way he went after AOC is, uh, is really problematic. And I'm glad, you know, as a journalist, I shouldn't be saying, but I'm glad that Hillary Clinton, a lawyer, <laughs> raised the issue of libel and defamation with what Fox does. Um, I think you, Brian, said this in a newsletter this week. A lot of people on the right are wishing for uh, uh, an attack on Times versus Sullivan in the Supreme Court. You said, boy, Fox better watch out if that happens. The right wing channel, I agree. They are way closer to violating it than anybody else at CNN or even MSNBC. Well, that catches up to Times v. Palin. So this week, the Times prevailed in Times v. Palin. But there's a controversy about the judge sharing his ruling before the jury actually weighed in. And so now, you know, even more reason why this is going to go to the appeals. There's going to be more and more debate about libel laws and whether to loosen them up. So you have Hillary Clinton saying Fox is close to actual malice. You have AOC saying Tucker's libelously harassing me. But what is what is this environment where you have people now really engaging in legal talk saying, I mean, look, let me put it this way, Mara. You don't think Hillary Clinton's actually going to sue Fox, right? She's not actually going to sue Fox News. No, for Hillary Clinton to sue Fox News for defamation would be the greatest gift that she could hand to them. And in fact, oh. Sean Hannity <laughs> says, bring it on. He was practically salivating at the prospect mm. because it would be great for their ratings. They would likely win, so it would be a huge PR victory for them. So I don't think that Clinton is going to invite something like that. But when it comes to all of these cases that we're seeing of public figures exploring avenues like this, yeah. actual malice, libel, defamation, it really brings to the forefront the challenge that public figures have because they don't just have to prove that it's false or that it injured them or damaged them in some way. They have to show actual malice, which is an almost impossible standard. Now, that is part of what makes the United States one of the most press-friendly countries in the world, and people can debate about the fairness of that, but it really is about protecting the freedom of the press. But we are now seeing some challenges to that, and there's a, a really phenomenal article that I would refer people to in the Washington Post today, an opinion piece by a law professor that talks about some of the challenges to these laws, and that these defamation laws we may be at one of the most vulnerable points that we've been in in decades it is monday the 21st of february of 2022 and you are in west coast cookbook and speakeasy i am your chef de cuisine justice putnam gunner the english bulldog is our snoozing sous chef and our daily special is river city hash mondays oh yes a weekend and uh, we make the hash on Mondays. You know, it's comprised of, well, everything from the weekend, as, is, as it normally is. I gotta say, though, a classic dish like a hash, uh, you can't really find a good one, at least in my neck of the woods. It used to be that was on everybody's menu. Now it's, I don't know, I guess a specialty item now. And uh, the ones that I've gotten, a little heavy on the salt, guys. Okay, I mean, you, when you're putting in the spam or whatever else, there's a lot of salt in that already. So, you know, come on back a little bit. Don't be throwing those um, salt flakes on there. It's uh, getting it a little too salty. At least, I would say for my taste. But, hey, I also trust my palate. Okay, from years and years of experience. So how are you doing on this Monday? Uh, we haven't, uh, I don't know, been vaporized in a nuclear annihilation yet. <laughs> yet. Uh, never know what Vlad has in mind because, well, he's Vlad. Mobster, KGB, anything is possible. So uh, I, I also don't understand why certain parts of the left... And then also the right complaining too. say that many of us are, I don't know, on a drumbeat to war like we want to have the war that Joe Biden wants to have a war. And why is he keeping keeps inflaming uh, Putin? <laughs> Wait a second. That's Putin gaslighting for you right there. Joe Biden and the rest of us want to stop this war. 
Joe Biden didn't amass, I don't know, half a million troops all the way around Ukraine. He's not shelling people in the Donbass. That's not Joe. <laughs> all right. All these Snowden and Assange apologists seem to be apologists for Putin, too. I wonder why that is. Makes you wonder. All right. We are, are in perilous times. And uh, I don't know. You would think that that uh, people would be discouraged from putting us into more peril, especially since oh, we're all supposed to be on the same page. We're Americans. And those who aren't on the same page, by default, are not Americans. So therefore, the Republicans are not Americans. Why are they still in office? I know. That's a leap in reasoning. But hey, sometimes you got to take a leap. Okay. Is, uh, is the trucker protest over in Canada? I, I, I think that it may be sprouting up in other areas because there's a lot of right wing money out there. Deep pocketed right wing money. In fact, they were exposed. All sorts of companies in the, in the United States funded that. Jeez. No wonder they don't want anyone to know. Because when you get caught, Sales could go down, and you might even have to go to jail. Mm-hmm. So, beware. Also, that was, at, you know, the, the story at the top about Hillary. And I, you know, I've often wondered why Hillary didn't hit back a little bit harder in the lawsuit arena. Now, I understand that, you know, it'd be like the Streisand effect. But uh, apparently the only thing that is halfway respected, at least when we do it now, it's normally respected and ex expected on their side. But if someone stubs your toe, <laughs> you, you sue. So Hillary, using the legal nomenclature, mm -hmm, malice. That made them shut up. They went on what we like to call radio silence. Let's talk about anything but that. Because they are not a news organization. And I hate this thing of like, oh, well, it's, it's somewhat excused because they're just in it for the money. They're just business people. Well, why is all this right-wing Nazi money uh, funding all this stuff? It seems like a closed circle. It seems like it. And um, I don't excuse it. It's like, oh, yeah, well, we're not really into politics except right wing politics. All right. Now that we know. And how do we fund ourselves? It's not from Soros money. That's for sure. You know, he does all the good things. You know, he's just like build schools and all this other stuff. You know, rarely does he just start putting money into people's accounts. Oh, yeah, I woke up one day and there's like millions of Soros dollars in there. How, how, how did that happen? Well, it never did. And it never will. On the other hand, you might be uh, groomed, and I like to say doomed, to being a uh, GOP candidate or activist of some sort. And uh, they often wake up and find a bunch of money in there. And I don't know, it could come from the Petersons. Could come from the Devosses. Could come from the Cokes. Could come from, uh, you know, well, we have a story about Credit Suisse in there and a data breach of their accounts and client list and some pretty unsavory practices going on there with a lot of unsavory characters and, uh, well, clients. We'll get into that a little bit later, but I just had to get that out there because it's all part of the whole. We could read the Panama Papers. Remember the Panama Papers? I don't know. People go, what's that? Is that what you roll your Panama red with? Well, sort of. I don't know why that's not more of a story. Everybody talks about how, oh, the Steele dossier was debunked. I don't know how debunked it was. 
first of all, first of all, it wasn't a dossier. It was raw data. And everybody knows what raw data is. And everybody's saying, oh, well, the thing that uh, with the prostitutes peeing on the bed, that never really happened the way it was described. So therefore, the whole report is thrown out. Excuse me. I don't think that's how raw data works. Okay. <sighs> Some salacious tidbit about uh, prostitutes peeing on the bed that o- the Obamas slept on when they were there. First of all, do you want to expend time and energy to prove that? I mean, this is a J. Edgar Hoover anymore. Okay. It's not like he put that uh, scenario together. That was somebody else. So uh, they got bigger fish to fry in terms of evidence. But it does kind of crack me up that the one that probably is the most truthful about Trump wanting to see a couple of uh, leggy Russian prostitutes peeing on the bed that the Obamas uh, slept on. Probably doing a little bit of, uh, I don't know, you, you know what I mean when a guy's sitting on the, the overstuffed chair. <laughs> watching a couple of leggy Russian prostitutes do their thing. Yeah, that's completely believable, to be honest with you. Nobody said that they peed on him. All right. But I could see where he's a dog and marking territory or destroying the territory where that dog Obama was is completely in line with that guy's mental behavior. So uh, now we got the Panama Papers, which is the point I was trying to make before I went off on another tangent. And that is completely forgotten this in a memory hole. Ghosted. Sort of like all President's Day. Yeah, President's Day is just a way to ghost both Lincoln and Washington. How dare they? We used to celebrate their birthdays because they were, you know, the great presidents, founders. Now we'll lump them all together, the good and the bad. And there seems to be a lot of bad ones from, yes, the other side. Oh, a uh, little tidbit. If you get a chance to see the movie Selma, do. It was uh, on uh, TCM last night. Astounding movie. Quite documentary-like but with a narrative drama and uh, yeah, talk about perilous times and all the work that happened and all the work it took to get LBJ to finally, because LBJ didn't take shit from nobody, anybody, anybody. I love how he put Wallace in his place. Um, all the effort, the deaths, that it took to finally get LBJ to sign not only the Civil Rights Act, but the Voting Rights Act. And then John Roberts and his crew from way back in Nixon days finally got the work done because they were on the uh, Soviet 50 to 70 year plan. Okay. All those old Soviet fighters adopted the Soviet techniques because they knew it so well. And here we are. Yep. Some 73, about about 70, is that it? 73 million? When the actual invasion from Russia comes, there's about 73 million that are going to be on the Russian side. How did that happen? One group of people were susceptible to brainwashing and another wasn't so much. Though there are some that are. Let's be clear. There's no such thing as absolutes now. But it is curious how the efforts to brainwash people were not directed at the critical thinkers who believed in due process and equal protection for all. The brainwashing wasn't directed at them. Nope, it was directed at those who already are predisposed to division. Mm -hmm. All right. I just got to say, it wasn't, you know, the Black Panthers blowing up white schools and Christian church, white Christian churches. I'm just saying that didn't happen. 
But you did have, and I no, I don't need to explain the opposite of that. We know what happened, but it is funny how it is all being pushed down a memory hall. And the perpetrators and their kids from back in the day are now trying to gaslight us into thinking that never happened. And if it did, it wasn't like how it was. Everybody liked being a slave. Everybody did. Free food, free housing. All you had to do was work, I don't know, 18, 20 hours a day. Get lashed. Have your kids ripped away from you. Yeah, family values. Well, what's on the rest of the menu here? It's Monday, yes. I'll get started. Um, Yes, what's on the rest of the menu? Because we do, of course, have a curated show for you today, as we do every day that we have West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Okay, on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, right-wing brown shirts have bullied hundreds of school districts to alter their lessons on race and social injustice in just a really a short amount of time. Mississippi Republicans want to defund one of the poorest, unhealthiest states in the nation, and that is Mississippi. And a Texas grand jury indicted 19 Austin police officers on charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for their actions during the 2020 racial protests. In fact, one of them is running for office, and the uh, pollsters say that his indictment will actually help his election to be a repug in office. Funny how that works. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison wants a full investigation into a Chinese naval vessel that pointed a laser at an Australian defense plane. And... A data leak of Credit Suisse has revealed some very unsavory details of over 30,000 unsavory clients. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. At netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page is our chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link, near the bottom of our homepage, at netrootsradio.com, to the left, is uh, our link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it would help us tremendously. Uh, We have been doing this powerhouse of resistance doing (laughs) we've been running this powerhouse of resistance for almost 11 years and we've been able to do it because of your help now if you could afford an espresso type coffee drink and if you could afford to send those funds to us once a month we are able to stretch those dollars beyond compare pay our bills fly under the radar continuing the continuous software and hardware upgrades and replacements of course and as i said continue this powerhouse of resistance that we've been re- uh, uh running for almost 11 years 24/7 365 by the way and we've been able to do it because of your help and thank you if you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then I get it linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. So follow me and you'll get those show notes and links uh, uh, much quicker than if you had to look for them yourselves. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West, and please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 and the Deep Archive 
from almost 11 years of Netroots radio shows can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Netroots Radio, look them up. We'll have the uh, link for that, as I mentioned before, on our homepage. We're due for our yearly uh, uh, upgrade. Yeah. Some people are no longer uh, podcasting. You know how that works. Wow. They do it for a long time, and then they stop. How dare they? Anyway, uh, we'll have those links on our homepage, and you can find them, of course, on the diary and other, other areas as well. All right, so this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press. And let me get this stupid dialogue box out of there. Thank you. And it is by Carolyn Thompson and Heather Hollingsworth. Conservative takeovers of local school boards have already altered lessons on race and social injustice in many classrooms. Now some districts are finding their broader efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion are also being challenged because their races have been let out of the box. As her Colorado School District's equity director, Alexis Knox Miller thought the work she and a volunteer team were doing was on solid ground, especially with an audit in hand that detailed where the district was falling short in making sure all students had the same opportunities. And, of course, you know the maggots want their kids who are pretty much uh, stunted. They want them to have more than equal protection. Let's make sure we understand what that's about. Well, in December, Knox Miller reluctantly disbanded the equity leadership team after more than a year of meetings. New conservative members had won a majority on the school board after voicing doubts about the work, and she worried the efforts might not lead anywhere. The new board says it will take up the issue in the spring. Yeah, sure they will. Around the time that the equity audit was being released, I realized that the tide had changed around diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, Knox Miller said. People were conflating the definition of equity with critical race theory, as if anybody knows what that means. And the absurd accusations that we were teaching critical race theory in classrooms to kindergartners began. Well, critical race theory means that you're just teaching them anything about black history, and you can't have that. Some issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion can thread their way through every part of a school system, including recruitment, services, and equipment. The debate carries implications for hiring and spending. In some districts, proposals aimed at making schools more welcoming places for students from diverse backgrounds have been reversed so that the bully white kids can beat the crap out of everybody like in the good old days. School administrators say critical race theory, a scholarly theory that centers on the idea that racism is systemic in the nation's institutions, is not taught in K-12 through schools. It's taught in the third year of your law school. Come on. But that has done little to sway opponents who assert that school systems are misspending money perpetuating divisions and shaming white children by pursuing initiatives they view as critical race theory in disguise. You know, these are the same people that said Obama was born in Kenya because, you know, they're critical about race. And that's their theory. In a fraught political climate that already has escalated fights about pandemic mask and vaccine requirements, divisions are taking a toll, said Dan Dom Dominich, executive director of the School Superintendents Association. Even in districts that are not threatened as much, they're thinking twice about what they say and what they do and how they go about doing it because it is having a chilling effect on the whole equity, diversity, and inclusion movement. And that's exactly what the Nazi races want.
Emily Waxter Pettis of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Mississippi is accustomed to being first in worse. It is one of the poorest, unhealthiest states in the nation, with public schools that are chronically underfunded. Now, some Republican leaders say a good way to boost the state's fortunes would be to phase out its income tax. There is no downside to putting money back into the pockets of Mississippians, said Republican House Speaker Philip Gunn, one of the main sponsors of a tax cut bill advancing in the legislature. Opponents say erasing the income tax is a terrible idea because it would mean even less money for schools, less money for health care, roads, and other services, especially hurting poor and working class residents. The Mississippi income tax accounts for 34% of state revenue. Wealthy people would see the biggest financial boost from eliminating the income tax because they are the ones paying the most right now. Democratic State Senator Hob Bryan said people don't choose where to live because of tax policy, but because of family ties and quality of life. He said people live in high-tax New York, for example, because the city offers opportunities. The notion that if the people in Manhattan only found out that Mississippi did not have an income tax, they'd be all, let's get on a bus to Mississippi and move down there. It's just laughable on its face. Mississippi's population has dwindled in the past decade, even as some other Sunbelt states are bustling with new residents. Tax cut proposals are a direct effort to compete with states that don't tax earnings, including Texas, Florida, and Tennessee, places to which many young Mississippians are moving for fatter paychecks. Married couple Les and Amanda Jordan live near the Mississippi town of Summit. He's a retired public school administrator, and she's a retired nurse practitioner. Both work for the state. Amanda Jordan said tax rates could influence young people's decisions about where to live. The couple has a grandson in Texas, one of the states without an income tax, but Les Jordan said he's torn. On first hearing about it, oh great. We'd have more money, he said. On the other hand, we're such a poor state. How would it affect those who are less fortunate? And I would say it would affect even those who are more fortunate because we're still talking about roads, health care, bridges, etc., etc., etc. Nine states don't have income tax and one more New Hampshire only taxes interest and dividends. And uh, Mississippi Republican Governor Tate Reeves is wholeheartedly behind the income tax elimination. We can throw out the welcome mat for dreamers and the visionaries, Reeves said. We can have more money circulating in our economy. It can lead to more wealth for all Mississippians. And you know what? That never works. Because the rich people take their tax break and they park it offshore and they don't spend it where they live. Coronado, Paul J. Weber, and Jake Blyberg of the Associated Press bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Texas grand jury indicted 19 Austin police officers on charges of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for their actions during the 2020 protests over racial injustice, injustice that spread nationwide following the killing of George Floyd. 
Multiple people spoke to the AP last Thursday on condition they not be exposed because they are not authorized to discuss the p- case publicly. Austin Police Association President Ken Kennedy confirmed that 19 officers are facing charges but did, did not have details. It ranks among the most indictments on a single police department in the U.S. over tactics used by officers during the widespread protests, methods that led to the resignation or ouster of several police chiefs across the country. Word of the indictments came hours after Austin City leaders approved paying $10 million to two people injured by members of the 1,640 officer department in the protests, including a college student who suffered brain damage after an officer shot him with a beanbag round. Combined, the charges and settlements amounted to conservative Texas's liberal capital of 960,000 people taking some of its biggest actions as criticism still simmers over its handling of the protests, which intensified pressure on then Chief Brian Manley to eventually step down. Jose Garza, the DA for Travis County, which includes Austin, spoke to journalists about the grand jury investigation but gave no specifics about it, including how many officers are facing charges and for what crimes. A spokesperson for the Travis County DA's office, Ismael Martinez, declined to comment on the number of charges officers charged and referred reporters to Garza's comments. Prosecutors have not identified any of the officers facing charges. Texas law requires that an indictment remain secret until an officer has been arrested. And actually, this is not an update of uh, the article as I expected because officers have been identified. And in fact, one of those is running for office. And as I mentioned uh, near the top, that uh, analysts are saying that his indictment may actually help his political career with the Republican Party. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, the truth will set you free. Pedro Almodovar's movies are characterized by complex female characters, as well as his use of bright colors, particularly red and orange. His latest offering, Parallel Mothers, has both, as well as familiar themes of deception and the redeeming power of the truth. Set in his native Spain, our protagonist Janice is a successful photographer paid by Penelope Cruz. She meets Arturo, a forensic anthropologist, on an assignment. His specialty is identifying mass graves from the fascist period. Arturo's work is a personal interest to Janice, who lost her maternal grandfather in that era. The two become lovers, with a 40-something Janice becoming pregnant and Arturo bowing out because he's married. Determined to go forward on her own, Janice meets another single mother at the maternity hospital, where she eventually gives birth. The two women form a friendship and, thanks to a million and one occurrence, have their lives intertwined forever. Unlike Janice, the teenage Anna is totally dependent on her parents and also, unlike Janice, isn't happy about her pregnancy. Her reluctant motherhood makes the film's unexpected twist all the more cruelly ironic. Without spoilers, Janice's choices after this twist, while cringeworthy, nonetheless make sense from her perspective. One of Almodovar's greatest gifts is creating complex characters who are nonetheless relatable. While we can all agree that lying is bad, there are exceptions to that rule, which he isn't afraid to explore. In some, Parallel Mothers is not only about the role of biological mothers, but that of the many people who serve as surrogates at various points in life. It's arguably Almodovar's best film in years, with solid performances, an intriguing story, and a fantastic look. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is 
an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. After a storm or disaster, it's important to eat only safe food. Throw away perishables like meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and leftovers stored above 40 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours or more. Throw away food with an unusual odor, color, or texture. Throw away food that may have come in contact with flood water, including food in swollen, punctured, and damaged cans. When in doubt, throw it out. Hi, I'm Tom Hartman, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. This week, we are joined by a very special guest, Vicki Ross Norris, an actress, educator, and member of the Center for Civic Education's Board of Directors. Dr. Ross Norris, given that many of the framers of the Constitution were slaveholders, how should Americans think about our nation's founding? Ignoring the fact that they were slave owners is ignoring the foundation of civics and understanding America. Once we ignore that, we won't know how to change that until we realize what our history was, we're probably prone to repeat it. And by ignoring that, slave owners were our forefathers of our country. We may forget that and return to that, but we are workable. Once you get civics knowledge in that framework, you understand that the mission is not accomplished. The mission is workable and has to be reassessed and that it has to be reopened and investigated. So when we look at the forefathers, we have to acknowledge what they did, how they did it, not to repeat that portion of their uh, fallacies as human beings, but to build a better foundation and find a deeper meaning of those words that they spoke in and wrote in the Constitution. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Ross Norris. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. It was a good day for the free press. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. And that was the statement of the chief executive of The New York Times after the jury and judge ruled against Sarah Palin in her libel suit against the paper. Palin's claim was based on a 2017 editorial that asserted that Palin had a causal connection to the 2011 mass shooting in Arizona that left six dead and 14 others wounded, including Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. The Times got it wrong. Contrary to the editorial, there was no evidence that Palin had incited the shooter. But Palin lost because she's a public figure and a public figure in a libel case must prove that the newspaper published the falsehood knowing that it was false or with reckless disregard for whether it was true or not. What the law calls actual malice. It's a high standard, protective of the press, established by the Supreme Court in the 1964 case of New York Times versus Sullivan. But after the verdict, the press is not resting easy. Palin's case laid bare the Times' sloppy journalism in this instance, mitigated by its prompt correction and retraction. But this case has focused debate on how, in this case, or more likely in another, the high court will rule on how much a free press, guaranteed by the First Amendment, should be protected, on whether New York Times versus Sullivan should be affirmed or not. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Across the United States, workers enjoy the first Monday of September as their holiday. Labor Day has become known as a day for family picnics and community parades. 
But do you know how Labor Day really started? Labor Day was first officially recognized on this day in labor history. The year was 1887. At the request of union members and workers, several states had started discussing setting aside a working man's holiday. In 1882, the Central Labor Council of New York City held the very first Labor Day parade. That first parade saw some 10,000 workers proudly marching in the streets. Five years later, on this day in labor history, Oregon became the very first state to officially declare such a working man's holiday. Also that year, Colorado, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and New York followed. By 1894, a total of 30 states across the nation had passed legislation for a similar celebration for workers and their valuable contributions to society. That same year, the federal government declared the first Monday of September officially Labor Day. Some critics in the labor movement have noted that Labor Day served as a more benign alternative to May Day. May Day is considered a more radical workers' holiday commemorating the 1892 Haymarket Martyrs Massacre in Chicago and the struggle for the eight-hour workday. May Day is celebrated by workers throughout much of the world. Recently, May Day marches and protests have seen a resurgence in the United States, especially around issues of immigrants' rights. Whether workers gather in September or May, it is an important time to remember Remember our shared history and our continued struggle. United we bargain, divided we beg. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where we are currently under a winter weather advisory. Uh, temperature currently is at 31 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of only around 40, much cooler than what we had over the weekend. And it uh, looks like we're going to have rain early, then remaining cloudy with showers in the afternoon. Uh, we did have a forecast of a snowy mix, but that did not actually occur here at the mothership, though it is misty there at the moment. And at the temperature, it looks like it might be a freezing mist. So there. Occasional occasional sh snow showers tonight with lows about 27. Winds light and variable and should have uh, accumulations of around an inch. Sunshine and clouds mixed tomorrow with highs in the mid-40s. Winds remaining light and variable. Uh, confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon continue to rise. Yes, they do. Uh, we now stand at 413,091 confirmed cases, and our deceased have increased by two, and we now stand at 456 dead. Pollen is rated as none right outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is good at 31 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is moderate at level three. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.03 inches. Visibility is up to 8 miles. And relative humidity is at 97%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 51 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 50 and cloudy. Rome is 61 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 45 and cloudy. Kabul is 42 degrees with light rain. Hong Kong is 45 and it is raining. Tokyo is 36 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 74 degrees and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 43 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 40 degrees Fahrenheit 
and it is sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Reuters staff brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Australia's Prime Minister said today a Chinese naval vessel that pointed a laser at, at an Australian military aircraft was so close to Australia's coast that it could be seen from the shore and urged a full Chinese investigation. Scott Morrison told media his government had not received an explanation from China over the incident from last Thursday, which Australia considered dangerous and reckless. China said Australia's versions of events did not square up with facts and that Australia had dropped a soda boy, which can help detect submarines near Chinese ships, which just happened to be in the Australian exclusionary zone. But who's counting? The Australian Defence Ministry did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The Chinese Navy vessel directed a military-grade laser at an Australian military aircraft over Australia's northern approaches, illuminating the plane and potentially endangering lives. Such a laser is normally pointed to designate a target ahead of the discharging of a weapon. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Anonymous staff at the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays, a German newspaper and other media yesterday Sunday, said a leak of data from Credit Suisse, Switzerland's second biggest bank, reveals details of the accounts of more than 30,000 clients, some of them unsavory. The uh, details or the, or the clients, or as I like to say, both. And points to possible failures of due diligence in checks on many customers. Credit Suisse said in a statement that it strongly rejects the allegations and insinuations about the bank's purported business practices. The German daily Süddeutsche Zeitung said it received the data anonymously through a secure digital mailbox over a year ago. It said it's unclear whether the source was an individual or a group, and the newspaper did not make any payments or promises. The newspaper said it evaluated the data, which ranged from the 40s until well into the last decade, along with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and dozens of media partners, including the New York Times and The Guardian. It said data points to the bank having accepted corrupt autocrats, suspected war criminals, and human traffickers, drug dealers, and other criminals as customers. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking war news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, hopefully, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 